Very good morning. Who you gonna call? We heard last week how David, in his fear, called on Achish, the king of Gath, and sought refuge among the Philistines. The two main characters, David and Saul, take turns to be in the spotlight. The author of 1 Samuel contrasts their personal responses in the face of despair and fear. Even as we come to the end of Saul's reign and the beginning of David's. So this week, we come back to Saul before his death. This is his last chance to redeem himself, if there's any chance at all left. Who is he going to turn to? We will look closely at chapter 28 today, and I have three divisions to focus our attention. Saul's fear, Saul's seeking, and Saul's solution. And before we begin, let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word that is so precious to us. Thank you for your word that gives us light. Thank you for your word that shows us that you are the one and only true God. And may you help us, help me, to preach your word simply and clearly today. And may you help all hearers to be transformed through the power of your Holy Spirit. I pray in the name of Jesus, the giver of eternal life. Amen. This is uh, going to be our first division. Now Samuel had died, and all Israel had mourned for him and buried him in Ramah, his own city. And Saul had put the mediums and the necromancers out of the land. The Philistines assembled and came and encamped at Shunem, and Saul gathered all Israel, and they encamped at Gilboa. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart trembled greatly. Let's look at the various circumstances surrounding Saul at that time in order to understand his in intense fear. Just a flashback, if you recall my previous message uh, when we talk about David, Abigail, and Nabal in chapter 25, there was just a single verse that announced the death of Samuel. Now Samuel died, and all Israel assembled and mourned for him, and they buried him in his house at Ramah. What is the reason Samuel's death is reemphasized here again in this chapter? Almost word for word, with the addition of a little bit more information, which we will examine later. Compare this. Now Samuel had died, and all Israel had mourned for him and buried him in Ramah, his own city. This is in 1 Samuel 28, 3, which we also found in 1 Samuel 25. And Saul had put the mediums in, and the necromancers out of the land. This verse sets the background for Saul's fear. It reminds us of the spiritual emptiness left by Samuel's departure, especially at a point when Saul was facing deeper misery for his disobedience. The mention of Samuel's death again is important for the events that will follow in this narrative. Saul was feeling so lonely, very lonely, too lonely in fact, facing many real as well as imaginary battles that he had brought upon himself. He had no Samuel to provide him with prophetic divine guidance. So he would later attempt to ask God directly what he should do. But we learn that God refused to answer him either by dreams or by sacred lots or by the prophets. Saul is scared because we are also told that the Philistines are now at Shunem. If you see the map, you'll have a better understanding on 
how the battle positions were being taken. Shunem was in the valley of Jezreel, which was about 20 miles northeast of Aphek. Aphek was the most northerly Philistine city. The Philistines were preparing for a big battle against their arch enemies, Israel. And the fact that the Philistines gathered at Shunem showed how deep and how far inside Israel they had penetrated. We can understand why if we know that the Jezreel Valley in the plains of Megiddo was a very strategic military and trade route junction linking the north, that is Lebanon and Syria in the north, and the south, that is Egypt, as well as the east, that is Jordan, to the west, which is the Mediterranean Sea. And today, if you go to Israel, you will see how vast and flat the Jezreel Valley is. And if you stand at Mount Carmel on the west, you can see right across to the southern side of the Sea of Galilee. And last but not least, the Philistines had always been a snare to Saul since the historical moment when David had killed Goliath. Saul had always been fearful of the Philistines. And this also explains why David, in his despair, had escaped to Philistines' territory twice to avoid, God, to avoid Saul's relentless pursuit. David was fully aware of Saul's weakness. Without God, Saul feared the Philistines. On the other hand, we are also told that Saul gathered all the armies of Israel on the slopes of Mount Gilboa. Yet, when he saw the Philistines across the plains of Megiddo, he was scared. Indeed, I think that it must have been a very scary sight for anyone, and in particular, everyone in Saul's camp. The Philistines were physically huge and strong, as we know, and they were not only in vast numbers, but they were also armed with more advanced weapons, such as chariots. The Philistines were very well prepared, having successfully marched to Shunem from Aphek with their best army. They were exceedingly optimistic. Now, recall Saul's courageous days when he defeated the Ammonites earlier in 1 Samuel chapter 11. Of particular note is 1 Samuel chapter 11, verse 6, where we read that the Spirit of God rushed upon Saul when he heard these words. Which words? The Ammonites' humiliating condition for a treaty with Jabez Gilead, and his anger was greatly kindled. Saul was a man of great courage when the Spirit of God was with him. But by this time, God had already deserted Saul. Do you remember what happened in chapter 19 when Saul went to look for David in the town of Naioth in Ramah? As the Spirit of God once came on Saul to set him as king of Israel, the Spirit of God then publicly stripped Saul of his kingly robes and power. And this you can see in these verses, 1 Samuel chapter 19, verses 23 to 24, which reads that the Spirit of God came upon him also. And as he went, if you remember, he prophesied until he came to Naioth in Ramah. And he too stripped off his clothes, and he too prophesied before Samuel and lay naked all that day and all that night. That thus it is said, is Saul also among the prophets. Interestingly too, 1 Samuel 28.3 records for us how Saul had banned the mediums and the necromancers from the land of Israel. Now Samuel had died, and all Israel had mourned for him and buried him in Ramah, his own city, and Saul had put the mediums and the necromancers out of the land. In the Mosaic law, God had commanded his people 
not to turn to mediums and necromancers, that is, those who communicate with the dead. Do not turn to mediums or necromancers. Do not seek them out, and so make yourselves unclean by them, because I am the Lord your God. This is consistent with the very first of the Ten Commandments, whereby people of God are to have no other gods than God himself. Saul had gotten rid of all the evil practitioners in his earlier days when he was guided by Samuel's spiritual leadership and the Spirit of the Lord. To his credit then, Saul had obeyed the commands in the Mosaic Law to cast out those who were practicing the occult. Now, coming back to Saul's fear, Saul began to lose his courage when the Spirit withdrew from him, as we found even earlier in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 14. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. Now the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. Do you remember uh, how Saul was trying to throw his spear at David twice? So we can see that Saul's spiritual condition is in disarray, and that is the real root cause of his fears. As he faced the Philistines, he saw the shadow of Goliath because he did not have the Spirit of God in him. He started counting everything that he lacked. He was lacking in terms of the numbers of soldiers. He was lacking in the superiority of the weaponry. And he was lacking in the spiritual guidance he used to receive from Samuel when he was there. And most of all, he had no God to count on. So the principle for all of us is this. God gives courage to those who rely and count on him. Courage is not the absence of fear, but the presence of faith in a God whom we can count on. Faith in God gives us the courage to overcome our fears and move ahead, even though circumstances may be challenging. Psalm 23 has this comforting verse for us. Even though I walk through the valley of a shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Fear is a very real emotional response. But the greater truth is that faith in God is the real solution. When our eyes are taken off our faithful one, we become fearful. Courage comes from knowing that God is sovereign and that he is in control of all our circumstances. The key difference between Saul and David is how they dealt with their fears. While Saul was counting his fears, David knew he could always count on God even though he walked through the valley of the shadow of death. And how about us? Is our faith greater than our fears? We shouldn't fear when we abide in our God. Only when our faith is greater than our fear can we move forward in our weaknesses and keep doing what is right despite our fears. For David... His faith in God overcame his fear of men. He would always come back to the Lord. If we do not fear God and we see that in Saul's life of disobedience, we will fear men. If there's anyone we should fear, let it be God alone. We move on to our second division, Saul's seeking. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart trembled greatly. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams or by Urim or by prophets. Actually, it seems that Saul still had hope 
that God would speak to him through dreams, to the Urim, or in modern days, this is equivalent to the flipping of a coin, or by the prophets. These were the usual ways God revealed himself then. Although it is recorded for us that Saul inquired of the Lord, it is clearly out of desperation. If you recall, Saul started well under the godly counsel and guidance of Samuel. After he was chosen by God to be the king that the Israelites had desired for so long. His first misstep came three years after he was called to that role. In the run-up to the battle with the Philistines, if you remember correctly, Saul didn't wait for Samuel for the sacrifice ceremony. And he carried out the sacrifice on behalf or in the place of Samuel, the priest. He overstepped his royal duties. He chose to dictate how the sacred things of God should be done. And he put himself above God and above God's order. Samuel warned him then, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God with which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. Saul disobeyed the Lord again when he did not get rid of all the Amalekites and their possessions. He had been commanded by God through Samuel, yet he disobeyed. In typical worldly human tradition, Saul even blamed his men and others for his sin. This is what the Lord had to say about Saul. The word of the Lord came to Samuel, I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. Additionally, we know of his sin of jealousy and his murderous intentions towards David, despite the fact that David spared his life quite a number of times. Saul sinned and sinned again. In all these, Saul disregarded what he knew to be God's will. If Saul continually rejected what was clearly God's will for him, it is not surprising that God was silent when Saul sought him in desperation. And this brings us to our second principle. Obedience to God's will, obedience to God's revealed will, is key to seeking God's hidden will. I borrow this from Pastor Daniel. If we want God to guide us, we must follow the guidance that he has clearly revealed in the scriptures. For Saul, it was God's word to him through Samuel. For us, it is the Bible. Saul was not sincere in seeking God's will. He was simply in a survival mode and he was utterly desperate. There's this story told by Spurgeon in his autobiography. A man on his deathbed sent for him. In his lifetime, this man had jeered at Spurgeon, had often denounced Spurgeon as a hypocrite. Now in desperation and death, he called for Spurgeon. Spurgeon wrote, this man had, when he was healthy, wickedly refused Christ. Yet, in his death agony, he had superstitiously sent for me. Too late, he sighed for the Ministry of Reconciliation and sought to enter in at the closed door, but he was not able to. There was no space left for him than for repentance, for he had wasted the opportunities which God had long granted him. How about us? Are we like Saul who sought the Lord only when desperate? Or are we sincere in seeking his hidden will in our lives? If we are, let us first walk daily in obedience to his revealed will throughout our lives.
When God did not answer Saul, who did he turn to? Let's check this out in our third division. Then Saul said to his servants, Seek out for me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, Behold, there is a medium at Endor. So Saul disguised himself and put on other garments and went, he and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night. And he said, Divine for me by spirit and bring up for me whomever I shall name to you. Saul's solution distanced himself even further away from God. His solution was dark and misdirected. He turned to the occult because he wanted to hear directly from Samuel, the prophet. In doing so, he did what he had forbidden himself. He was being hypocritical, isn't it? He broke his own edict that he had issued earlier when he had effectively put an end to the practice of an occult in God's land. He had done right when the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. He was desperate now that the Spirit of the Lord had abandoned him. Let's look at more details to understand how foolish he was. Look at the map again. Saul's servant had told him there was a medium at Endor. Endor was northeast of Mount Gilboa, where the Israelites' camp was. Endor was also about four miles northeast of Shunem, if you look at the map, where the large army of the Philistines was preparing for battle. Shunem was in Saul's way to Endor from Mount Gilboa. It was dangerously too close for him. He was putting his own and his men's lives at risk for wanting to know his future. To meet the medium at Endor, Saul had to be extremely careful not to be within the Philistine site. So he went under the cover of darkness. He disguised himself so that his own army wouldn't think he was fleeing from the battle. He disguised himself because he did not want to be recognized by the medium. We fully know that disguise is plain deception. Later, when confronted by the medium who was fearing for her own life, Saul tumbled deeper into sin and even used God's name in vain. But Saul swore to her by the Lord. As the Lord leaves, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. As Saul sought the medium, he brought upon himself a curse. Because God had said in Leviticus 26, if a person turns to mediums and necromancers, warring after them, I will set my face against that person and will cut him off from among his people. This was the last straw. Hoping to hear good news from Samuel's spirit, he came off this occultic encounter completely dejected. Fear gripped him even more, and fear paralyzed him. Hope turned into hopelessness. God allowed Samuel's spirit to appear in order to reaffirm to Saul what Saul already knew. It was to be judgment and death sentence passed upon him by God himself. He got to hear firsthand his and his son's fate. In addition, Israel's defeat was imminent, and the kingdom would pass over to David, his other enemy. Despite feeling weak and shaking, he had no appetite. But finally, he ate his last supper, offered not by God, not by Jesus, but by the medium. Saul persistently disobeyed God, and God remained silent. This was God's final rejection of a miserable thought. 
So who do we turn to in times of despair? Who we turn to reveals our true belief. Turn to God alone, who is the real solution for all our needs. Turn to God alone, who is the real solution for all our needs. This is our third principle. Christians should have nothing to do with occult thoughts and practices. There's nothing attractive in these. Stay away. Apart from the occult, do we turn to other solutions that the world offers? How about horoscopes? May his word remind us to turn only to our almighty God, who is the real and only solution to all our troubles. Psalm 1 to 1 has this to encourage us. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep because the Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Should we now answer the question we had at the start? who you're going to turn to. We know on certain terms, let it be our almighty God, for he is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Let's pray.